famous YouTuber Tom Scott has an amazing video about the number of possible YouTube videos. The basic idea is every YouTube video is identified by a string of 11 characters. Um, you can, for each of those 11 characters, you can pick from, a, from 64 possible characters. You have the 26 uppercase letters, the 26 lowercase letters, the 10 decimal digits and two special digits, hyphen and underscore. And um, well, with basic combinatorics, you know that if you have 64 possible characters and you take 11 of those in a sequence, then you get 64 raised to the power of 11 um, possible strings. That would be 73 quintillion, <laughs> according to Tom Scott's video. Now, computers prefer to think in base 2 instead of base 64. Um, 64 is a power of 2. Uh, it's uh, 2 to the power of 6, right? Let's quickly check that. So, 2 to the power of 6 is indeed 64. Okay. Um, so, we can simply map each of those characters to a sequence of 6 bits, right? Here you can see the mapping. Each character is mapped to a sequence of 6 bits. So, A is um, all zeros because it is the lowest number and uh, the, the underscore is all ones because it is the, uh, the highest number. Okay, so if we, if we have a sequence of six bits for um, 11 characters, we do that 11 times, we get um, 66 possibilities. Here you can see it uh, for that example above. So G, if you simply look it up, is, is this bit sequence, or if you look it up, is this bit sequence and so on, right? So this sequence has 66 bits in total. Let's see, that would be the same number, 73 quintillion. It's just a matter of how you <laughs> split those numbers up. Okay, now um, the number 66 is rather unusual for computers. Um, what's a nice power of 2 that's near to 66? That would be 64. Let's see what's the value of 2 to 64. That's 18 quintillion. And um, the theory I propose for this video is maybe YouTube only uses 64 of those bits. Right? So for example, maybe um, YouTube only uses those 64 bits, which would mean that the last two bits are always zero. They are simply ignored. Um, so for the last digit, we only use four bits, which would mean we only have 16 possible characters in the last position. And that's the theory that I'm going to check <laughs> in the following minutes. Okay, now how would we check this? So um, we could simply gather a list of YouTube IDs and see if uh, the theory, theory holds up. YouTube has a REST API which you can use um, but unfortunately, this REST API, every time you call it, you use up some quota and that uh, <laughs> drains very fast. So I already prepared um, a list of um, YouTube uh, video information, if you will. So maybe let's look at one of those files. I downloaded nine files. Uh, home thread A, oops, A. You can see the first file, it's just a long string, maybe not, um, very readable. Let me make this a little bit more like this, my favorite macro. <laughs> uh, let's slurp it and then print it. Yeah, so that's what you would see if you opened that video, that um, text file up in any text editor. Okay, you can see oh, that this looks like a JSON string. So we have uh, um, a JavaScript object. Uh, here we have our key value pairs separated by colons. Keys and values are strings in JSON. Um, is there anything interesting going on? Here you can see that um, Tom Scott has uh, 644 videos, at least at the time of this upload. And the REST API allows you to receive uh, 50 video informations or, or information about 50 videos with one call. Um, and here's the interesting bit. So behind the items key, we find an array um, and inside that area are 15 Java, 50 JavaScript objects. And uh, under the ID um, key, we find another object with the video ID key. And here you can see um, one example video idea. Again, 11 characters. 
Um, we can see it ends in a Q. Let's look up the uppercase Q. You can see it here. Yeah, it ends in two zeros. So at least it, uh, the theory holds up for the first video. Okay. Um, right. So if we have the string and we want to process this data in JSON, uh, we want to turn it into a normal um, closure data structure, right? <laughs> How would we do that? So I imported the closure data JSON library. So we can simply say uh, JSON, oops, read, read string, uh, right, like this. And let's uh, go to the beginning, right. So you can see now instead of a JSON object, we have a closure map. Here you can see the first key, and the first value. Uh, you, you will note the uh, missing colon over here. You know what, let me pretty print this also. Right, you will note the missing colon and the keys are still strings. That's not very idiomatic in closure. We prefer to have keywords as keys in maps. Um, <clears throat> so how would we convert those strings into keywords? Let's see, um, options are the same as for read. So let's peek into the read doc and switch back to read string so we don't forget. Um, so what are some options we can pass? Um, let's see here, key function. Um, mm -hmm. Content property name, so those are the keys. Uh, return, 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 default is closure core identity, so the identity function doesn't do anything. <laughs> so the key string will be mapped to the key string, not very useful. Um, but we can use the keyword function instead. Let's build it to closure. Whoops, wrong window. Um, so I can say the key function should be um, keyword, and of course I have to wrap this in parents, mm -hmm. otherwise the threading map will be confused. Let's start at the top here, and let's see. Okay, right, you can see now instead of strings, we have nice keywords. And um, the advantage is that keywords are functions of the map enclosure. So we can simply use those keywords as functions in the map to peek into the map or descend into the <laughs> lower levels in the map. Okay, um, so for example, we could, whoops, again, wrong window. We could say, I, I'm only interested in the items part of the result object and then we immediately get the um, uh, array that was previously associated, associated with items. Of course, it's not an array enclosure, it's a, it's a vector. Okay, very nice. So um, I would say this is so useful um, that we should turn this uh, into its own um, function. Again, here you can see the queue. Um, so let's call the function uh, read <laughs> read items and the a should be replaced replaceable with different um, file names so let's call it I don't know part and then um, we simply concatenate home thread with the part okay and then we have to close the defin okay here's not that function. Mm, and let's try to use it. So for example, read items for A should give us <laughs> uh, the exact same result. Oh, what did I do wrong? Unmatched delimiter. Let's see, oh, indeed, where did that guy come from? Okay, so there's the function. And um, Right, here we test it again and it still works, here's the queue. <laughs> but of course, I don't really want this pretty print over here that will again turn everything into a string. Let's do it like that. Right, and if we wanted a pretty print, we could do it here, but I don't really want to do that. Okay, um, how many of those items did we read? Should be 50? Yeah, okay, nice. Now I have nine of those files, so let's maybe simply map the read items function um, over uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that should be nine. Yeah. And in case you wonder why this works, uh, normally map has to be provided with a sequence like a vector or a list or something. Um, strings are all, uh, also sequences in Clojure. So if I call it, oh, they are seekable, <laughs> I can call the seek function on it. 
and you will get a sequence of characters. And this Drew function is perfectly happy to accept a character as well. So that's no problem. Um, now the read items function gave us a vector. And if we map that over a sequence, we would expect a sequence of vectors. And there you can see it, right? Here's our sequence and uh, here's our first vector. So I would expect that the sequence only has nine um, elements inside it, nine vectors of 50 items each. And if we want to flatten that structure, we have to use mapcat instead of map. That will give us all 450 items. So mapcat is called flat map in other functional languages in case you're confused. Okay, so let's remember that guy as, let's say all items. Okay, and then all items, well, you can see it here. Maybe let's again uh, do some pretty printing stuff just so we can see it better. Yeah, okay, cool. So here are all our items. What are we going to do next? Mm, right, so we wanted to peek inside the ID. Then we wanted to peek inside the video ID. And then thinking one step further, we want to look at the last character of the video ID. Okay, mm, so how do we do that? First, we don't want 450 items, we want 450 ID maps. Here you can see them. Now uh, we're only interested in the video ID part, so we can say map video ID, then it'll look like this. And now the P print is already kind of redundant. There's so little information that it's fine to print that all in one line. Okay, and that's the last step. We're only interested in the last character, and here you can see it. Okay, so if you have a sequence of characters, but could be anything, uh, strings or other complicated objects, we can have the frequencies computed for us. So there's a frequencies function in Clojure, returns a map from items to uh, the number of times they appear. So in our example, you can see the A uh, appears 24 times in the last position, the C 39 times, the E 31 times, and so on. Um, we're not really interested in how many times they appear. We're only interested in the characters that would be the keys in the map. Okay, so let's call the keys function. There we go. And you can see that's, that's not all possible uh, 64 characters, right? So just to contrast, if we had said we're interested in the first character, then you will see all of them are used. But the last character, only these guys, I think it's 16. <laughs> you can count it for yourself. Okay, um, maybe let's sort these guys just for fun. There we go. And uh, let's turn them into a string. Oh, what? <laughs> uh, we turned something else into this. Now we turn the sequence into a string. What we want to do instead is say, we want to call the string function with all those guys as, as arguments. So that would be apply the string function. Yeah, there you can see a classic mistake of mine. <laughs> okay, mm, right. And now you can see it crystal clear that the last character of every YouTube video is only one of um, 16 guys. Okay, right, so that proves our theory, at least for the 400 uh, videos that I tried. I wasn't able to falsi my, falsify my theory and therefore for now it's correct until someone gives me a counter example. Okay, and just for fun, let's replace it again. Yeah, that's the entire base 64 alphabet, the decimals, the uppercase, the lowercase, and then those special characters here. They just have a different um, ordering in the in the ASCII table. Okay. So maybe a quick recap. What did we do? I explained to you how um, YouTube video IDs work. They're encoded as uh, 11 characters in base 64. Here you can see the bit patterns. Here you can see an example. And um, then in the coding part, we wrote a function that reads a file from disk turns the contained JSON into a closure data structure. And since we're only, only interested in the items, we immediately peek in the um, items map. 
Then we simply tested that function that it really read all 50 items. Um, then we didn't want to read only the A file. We wanted to read all nine of those. Map catted <laughs> uh, the read items function all, all, over all nine of those. And then we had 450 items. And then just for the sake of this. So we started with all the items. Let me print print again. We started with all the items. <coughs> Here you can see them. Then we said we are really only, only interested in the ID part to get this. So let's uh, map the ID function or the ID keyword over it. Very nice. Then we only were interested in this part. So let's map the um, video ID keyword over it. Then we had the video IDs. Then we were only interested in the last character. That's why we mapped the last function over it. Very cool. Now let's get rid of pretty print. <laughs> then we were interested in how often do these characters appear. So here, for example, you can see that the Y uh, is, is, of course, a course multiple times. How often does it appear? We want to know for all the characters. Here you can see it. Then we're only really interested in uh, the distinct keys. Here you can see those. And then we could have stopped here, but for, for, for fun <laughs> and visual appeal, we sorted them, uh, applied the string function to it, and, um, and that was it. Right, very cool. Um, if you're interested how we can convert a 64-bit um, integer to a 11-character string like this, I highly recommend you, next, you watch my next video, which will be out hopefully soon where we will implement some closure code to do exactly that. See you then.